Hi, this is Paul. I checked the video this morning about 20 minutes after it posted, and there were already 35 comments. And at that point, I knew uh, this video was going to cause a lot of conversation. And as is usual for the comment section, all of you who actually leave comments, many of the comments were absolutely outstanding and insightful, and I was, I was happy to read them, and they were thought-provoking. So I want to talk about some of the comments. Let's start with Pseudo-Boethius, who referenced this First Things piece. You may not be interested in the culture war, but the culture war is interested in you. It will doubtlessly strike some as eccentric for me to play variations on a theme of, of Leon Trotsky in the title of this reflection on a crucial issue of Synod 2023, not CRC Synod. This is the Roman Catholic Church. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Seems apt, however, for two reasons. And, and then it goes, well, the second one I want to get into. And second, because the epithet culture warrior has been weaponized by certain Catholic factions to avoid debate about what seems, um, what seems to others to be hard and unavoidable truth, that in the Western church, the church must be a culture warrior because the dominant public culture is toxic. Um, now, Let's talk about the culture war stuff and winsome versus non-winsome approach. Those probably aren't the two best buckets for it, but the hmm. so the problem with having one video in mind when I get into the office um, and then another video is because uh, let's 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 go back here. So I've been reading Georg's book, and let's start there, because this issue of prophilicity and second-order observation is incredibly important in our current conceptualization of culture war. Again, this was, this was um, clipped uh, by someone for me, and I really just knew it, this was the video that he made and then took it down. Um, for this was again back on the um, Oliver Anthony uh, item that was up for a minute. Rather than seriously engaging with the actual working class problem addressed in the song, overtime hours for bullshit pay, it is primarily observed in the mode of second order observation. Less than observing the song itself, the media focus on observing how it is observed. In short, the public is warned not to like the song to avoid being labeled as right-wing by the general peer. The main purpose of the Guardian article is to tarnish the profile of the song and by extension of its listeners. If the right-wing loves it, then you become right-wing if you love it too. What is more, the song dares to bring up the image of fat, jobless Americans buying junk food with their welfare money. This image is not just highly realistic, but also a critique of an unjust capitalist economy where the wages of workers are so low that they are little different from welfare. The song depicts a capitalist system producing a choice of lifestyle for large parts of the population. Either you work endless hours for bullshit pay that leaves you with not much of a life to live, or you collect welfare and become part of a debilitated underclass who destroy themselves physically and mentally with the cheapest forms of consumption. That's second order observation. You basically, this is what that piece is talking about in terms of weaponizing culture warriors. And then I'm going to come back to the first things piece and talk about that a little bit. But it's all about basically this, um, this, this rhetorical warfare that's going on. And again, this is, if you read, if you listen to this Jordan Peterson video, or if you've listened to a bunch of what, what other stuff he's made, I mean, this is basically a, a feminine style of combat as opposed to a masculine style of combat, which tends to be violent and physical. But the point that Georg makes is that the second order observation very quickly gets weaponized and you're... You're told to dismiss or reject a particular approach, otherwise you will be labeled as right wing. And in and, and this piece, uh, Greg Lukanoff makes the same point. He's another one of these guys with 
Jonathan Haidt and many others that have said, hey, this, the way this is functioning in our culture is making us stupid. Uh, this is, we have to evaluate ideas and evaluate procedures in order to figure out where they go rather than just using the worst kind of, of rhetorical attacks. Here we go. I try to point out in the book, and a major part of the book, um, is we talk about different kinds of rhetorical fortresses. Um, and what we mean by that are really creative and some not very creative ways of getting out of addressing someone's actual argument. And we talk, we, we first go through the ones that left and right and basically all humanity uses, which we call the minefield and the obstacle course. But then when we get to on the left, we go through this thing that we call the perfect rhetorical fortress. It is just this exquisite maze of dodges uh, all over the place of ways to not have to address your, 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 the person's argument. And we even go through that what we call the, dem the first one, by the way, is labeling someone conservative. Um, and this worked back when, I, back when I was in law school. I'm embarrassed to admit, and, I, and I, I, I'm, uh, I'm very embarrassed to admit, it worked on me. That essentially, if you could label a me writer too. as, yeah, that if you could label a writer as conservative. Worked on me too. <laughs> this is a new Me Too movement. All of us former lefties <laughs> have to now con <laughs> confess our sins of our youth. <laughs> Good for Jordan to admit it then suddenly you took them less seriously um, and that that was something that I, I'm embarrassed to admit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's level one and that's just ridiculous. That's, that's the way children are, argue. But then we take through the entire demographic funnel and of course you can dismiss someone on the basis of gender, on the basis of sex, on the basis of uh, race, on the basis of etc. And we bring, get you down the, de the demographic funnel to about 0.4% of the entire population of the U.S. And then say, and by the way, none of that actually mattered because if you have the wrong opinion, like J.K. Rowling or, for that matter, um, uh, black conservatives, you're still discounted anyway. Um, and and well, one thing that really kind of gave truth to the lies, I talked to every black conservative writer and black moderate um, that I know. All of them said they've been told they're not really black um, for having the, having the wrong opinion. So it's really more of a dogma protection uh, system. So I do think that there is hope that if, if we basically can get, even if we can just establish, uh, get back to rules we all know are better for finding truth um, and get away from this ridiculous way of arguing that literally has no tr uh, help, uh, hope of getting you towards the truth and actually waste time to just get to whatever your opinion is, that if you can focus on uh, cr constructive ways of arguing, there is still some hope. I would also add that I see some hope in, in alternative educational methods that are popping up, especially post COVID. And, yes. you know, I think part of the problem is the education schools are so politicized in America and so feminized. And, um, and also at the same time, you have the vast majority. Okay. She makes a good point, but she's a woman. So we're not going to listen to her. I, I, I don't mean that. I don't mean that, <laughs> but the, the, the point that he made was the point I wanted to, I wanted to bring in. And, and of course, the, these kinds of things churches um, have been doing for a long time. And so then the epithet culture war has been weaponized by certain Catholic factions to avoid debate about what seems um, um, about what seems to others of us as a hard and unavoidable truth that um, that in the Western world, the church has been a culture warrior because of the dominant public culture is toxic. Now, again, there's we've got to really be careful about a certain golden age thinking that back in such and such a time, things were better. I'm sure in some ways they were better. I'm sure in other ways they were worse, so on and so forth. I, I very much agree with um, Aaron Wren's positive, neutral, and negative world thesis. I think the church has lost an incredible amount of status and influence in the culture and some of that loss has been because it has been successfully attacked. Others of that loss has been because the church has failed to live up to its own standards and to live out its own calling. Both of those things are true. You don't have to pick between them. They are both true at the same time. But, but let's, let's continue. Um, there is a culture war going on throughout the West. The question is, okay, how to wage it? The aggressor in the wars are determined to export their reduction of human person to a bundle of moral, um, commensurable desires to the rest of the world. And what this video, um, well, let's, what, what this, what this is about is is very much 
this is this is very much a culture war issue. And and the question, you know, I had a few thoughts today. I had to I had a meeting today. I had to do some driving, and it always gives me time to think. One one of the one of the made one of the things is, you know, th this. <laughs> so Chad and a few others made the comment that her father was an evangelical apologist, um, and I thought, yeah, she can argue. Um, she can argue she's persuasive. You know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, at least with respect to a lot of these other traits of being, um, of being aggressive and arguing her point and wanting to make her point. So, you know, kudos, kudos to her. But this very much is a culture war issue because we're really talking about what should the standards of our, what, what should the standards and ideals of our culture be? This war inevitably involves the Catholic Church, for if the Church is faithful to its Lord, it will defend and promote the truth about spiritual and moral dignity of those the Lord died and rose to save. I think that's very true. The Church must fight this culture war as a culture reforming counterculture with the distinctive weapons of evangelical clarity and pastoral charity. I think that's true too. The question then is, okay, how to go about doing it? And it gets a little bit further. The church is a culture in its own right. Christ does not simply infiltrate a culture. Christ creates culture by forming another city, another sovereignty. And I think that's true too. I mean, we're, we're all Augustinians here, Catholic and Reformed and, and Lutheran. Um, we're all Augustinians here, and that's right. Although, at the same time, I've been arguing for a very long time that, in fact, Christ has infiltrated the culture, and and even these, even our wars of culture now, are, in in some ways, within the tensions within various opponent processing tensions of Christianity, and so and the major ones being right now, say liberationism, which. There is definitely a liberationist theme in Christianity, yet there's also an obedience theme and a discipline theme in Christianity. And so liberationism and discipline are, in that sense, in opponent processing in Christianity. And when the liberation goes too far, you wind up with many of the, the social ills that, are, that, are, that we are talking about. In terms of what I, the wishful thinking I see on in some culture warriors, and I'm new, not using it as a derogatory statement, it, it's sort of that, well, we want to seize, we want to use the power of the state in order to um, reinforce our values. And that isn't illegitimate in a democratic society, Basically, a democratic society is ostensibly, in some ways, rather value neutral. And so if you can convince the majority of the population to, uh, to embrace your values, then your values will have status of law. Um, that has to, that's, a, that's something that has to be taken with a great deal of care because part of the danger of democracy is it is a majoritarian form of government and sometimes the minorities are harmed in the process and so democracies are always sort of trying to balance those things and and we continue to try to do those in the united states as well now there's a lot that's going on in this conversation and the let's say the <laughs> I talk about liberationist social justice and disciplinist social justice or conservative social justice. And I know when I say that, a bunch of people sort of get their hackles up because social justice together just offends them and triggers them. Okay, fair enough. And truth be told, you don't really need the word social in front of justice. Justice is by nature social. So we could call it liberationist justice versus disciplinist justice or conservative justice. And then the question is, well, what should be done in a case like this? One of the interesting things to consider is a point that I've tried to make repeatedly is that many of the issues that we are struggling are a function of technological disruption. Prostitution can now be 
perpetuated on the internet in a way that it could never have been done before the internet. Of course, there were mag dirty magazines and dirty movies and these kinds of things and, and individual um, prostitution. But now the OnlyFans, you now have these systems. And it's, it's helpful to remember that early on in the OnlyFans game, there was a moment where Stripe, I think it was, threatened to no longer service OnlyFans because so much of OnlyFans was was being used in this as sex work. And so the credit card company thought, well, maybe we'll maybe we'll not <laughs> maybe it's a little illicit if you can use a credit card to hire a prostitute. And what they and so first they sort of withdrew back from it and OnlyFans then was struck with terror and thought they would have to go to a Bitcoin uh, operation because, you know, how are they going to, the whole system falls apart if there's no exchange of money. And then, of course, the credit card company sort of did a, did a 180 and decided that, okay, you can use a credit card to hire a prostitute. And this is, this is what I think... Louise Perry, what Grim Grizz, what many social conservatives say, this is part of the problem of normalization. If you, let's say, can, can hold the line at, have sort of a pu broad public agreement about what is licit and what is illicit, and if we can all agree that prostitution is illicit, then credit card companies won't participate with OnlyFans, which then would drive them towards cryptocurrency. Now, now, Part of what we have going on here is that technology disrupts many of the conventional ways in which many of these professions have sort of broken out of the traditional prohibitions that have been in the United States. I think about, I was watching football on Sunday and FanDuel comes up. Now this is... <laughs> All right, somebody wanted to hear New Jersey stories. Well, I was working in a bakery in New Jersey, and uh, I got the job when the baker was Christian Reformed, and then he sold the bakery. And then there was a new mat, there was a new pharaoh in bakery Egypt, and um, the new guy was not a Christian. He was an alcoholic, and he um, he had a bookie. I'll just say it that way. I'll just say it. He had a bookie. And so, you know, we would often have to answer the phone and, you know, sometimes it was the bookie. And so he would place bets on the games with the bookie. And so what's amazing to me is that now watching this stuff on TV today, it's like, oh, the internet, now you can have a bookie. And I would assume, maybe you're wrong, maybe states have different policies on this. You can use your credit card for gambling. You can use your credit card for prostitution. Banks are now into the gambling and prostitution business. And I think many of us will say this is a great example of moral corruption in the nation. That standards have lowered, and I think that's right. The difficulty is to say, okay, now we want to get rid of these things. Uh, crypto. All right. So are we going to, and, and this is where crypto gets to be an interesting thing, because on one hand, when people hear, well, the United States wants to get rid of cash, because cash, of course, is untraceable. And have everything done in crypto, we're like, oh, no, because then the government's going to track all of our money, all of our exchanges. So the civil libertarian questions usually cut both ways. And that's where the libertarians in the culture get very interesting. And as I said in the video, in many ways, the libertarian, wherever you sort of posture yourself in many of these fights the libertarianism sort of wins because people get to the point where they say it is just a losing game socially for us to track, enforce, prosecute 
these things now as technology has distributed them. And so then you set up this whole discussion like legalization of drugs, uh, marijuana, for example. Is it better that marijuana has been legalized? Well, and then, of course, the state can tax it. And now, not only do you have credit cards where you can buy drugs, sex, and gambling, um, but now your drugs, sex, and gambling will also be taxed by the government. And so they are involved in it. And so this gets back again to the question, okay, culture warrior, what exactly are the ways you're going to wage this war? Now, again, it seems best to do it at the level of influence and conversion. At the same time, knowing no matter how much conversion you do, it will probably not reach above a certain bar. And even if you do so, there will be Christians who are involved in the gambling and the sex and the drugs. And, but at least then, in a sense, well, now we're going to treat it as a pastoral issue. Or we're going to discipline them out of the church. And so, in other words, these things get complex. There's another comment I wanted to read. This is a good comment. Sorry for the long post. No, I like the long posts. I'm wondering if I can get, if I can be less verbose, but I feel like I might be misunderstood. I don't know if anyone has the patience to read all of this, laugh out loud. Well, we'll see. I think it's very complicated to understand and explain what is going on. I agree. Part of it is that a lot of things are going on under the surface. It's going on in the underground. Suppose the ground represents attention space and it is hit by the light. The light cannot penetrate into the ground and therefore you cannot understand what is going on underneath. Let me, let me add a little bit to that and think about, because this is where you're going to go in the comments because I read the comment already, sort of the neuron and the brain. Uh, Grim Grizz played the excellent Chris Pacow uh, video where I was talking about spirits and when I was talking to Campbell, what was his first name? And, and the neurons participate in the brain, but that's all below the conscious level. And a lot of what's happening in something like this is sort of has that dynamic. Here's an analogy. Imagine that you are a heart cell. As a heart cell, you have certain demands. You demand oxygenated blood. You demand certain nutrients that the blood carries. You are performing your labor in the free market, and in return, you are getting oxygen oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood. Simultaneously, all along the way, you have no idea what the heart is. Furthermore, you don't know why you desire the nutrient-rich, oxygenated blood, and why you even want to live. Or what is the purpose of your existence? You just know that to live is good and to pursue certain desires is good. All that cell wants to do is do it function. Now again, we get sort of our Aristotelian question about wanting in this, and this gets the whole into um, loving to know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but here we are. Funny aside, if it were otherwise, if you ever begin to question your role and what you're doing, you may become a potential cancer cell and you are usually pruned. I think that most people in the economy are sort of like that heart cell. They have no idea what's going on under the surface, and there's a lot of truth to that. They have their tiny little role that they play. I, I often think about, you know, I took a job that is high meaning, low pay. And generally speaking, I'm happy with that exchange. I have, um, I've never wanted for food on the table. Um, I've had a a better lifestyle than my my parents had my grandparents were my parents were richer than my grandparents and i'm richer than my parents so you know but i chose a meaningful occupation rather than a financially lucrative occupation but i'm not living on the poverty line either there's a duality under the surface there is an inattention of what drives us, and there's another kind of inattention that is born out of perfect instrumentality of parts. 
To understand that latter kind of inattention, imagine you are a heart. From your perspective, you just want oxygenated, rich blood, just like the heart cell. But just like the heart cell is completely unaware of your existence, you too are completely unaware of the heart cell's existence. The heart cell is just me, you say, though the heart cell's um, perfect, non-anarchic instrumentality it has been eliminated from attention. It becomes part of the whole. And we have this all the time. We lose the attention of our hand and it just simply becomes part of us. Or even the glove or the stick or the car. The car becomes an extension of us. We talked about actually that on the live stream the other day. Further up and down the scale, depending on how you look at, look at it, the whole body may be instrumentalized within the family. And both the family and the individual body may be instrumentalized within the business or the nation state. None of them along the lines are attending to their underlying drives. And unless, of course, there is some pain coming up from an underlying drive and then you try to address that pain or something isn't working. It's debatable whether the proletariat is a real category. But suppose for the sake of the argument it is. In the modern economy, the proletariat exists in a state of perfect instrumentality within the whole, especially from the perspective of the bourgeoisie. Imagine an analogy to the bourgeoisie being the heart identity and the proletariat, the heart cells. The bourgeoisie tend to collectivize all of the efforts of the whole into a kind of systematized whole. We make that. We went to the moon. It's an American product. It's an Apple product. Steve Jobs made that, etc., etc. Simultaneously, the bourgeoisie tend to be very possessive about the products of its own labor and also emphasizes individual action and raising oneself in the bootstraps. There's a duality here. The bourgeoisie is both collectivist and individualist, depending on the frame. The perfect instrumentality of the proletariat means that when one looks at the product on the shelf, the contribution of the individual third world factory worker does not rise to the attention to the surface of attention. And so it becomes a kind of vague our product. America is great at putting products on the shelf, even if they were put together in China. We don't think about that. We see an Apple product and we say, ah, that's an American product. On a different level, from the level of the tax collector or other state actors, the bourgeoisie equally instrumental to the, as the proletariat. So there are layers of instrumentality. There is a unique and interesting modern development that is shown through the Black Mirror Season 1, Episode 2, and which has a real-world analogy in Oliver Anthony, the, fam the famous formerly proletarian mus musician and writer of Richmond, North of Richmond, as well as a number of other streamers and content creators. The phenomenon that is witnessed is this. The act of observing the proletariat and bringing it to attention automatically transforms that proletariat into bourgeoisie. Great point. This is the whole point of second order observation. All of this now... See... It's really hard to talk about attention because, especially if you're doing things like I'm doing on YouTube, it becomes immediately obvious that forces above your control are directing attention. Some of those forces are in people. So when I had the thumbnail, when I talked about the Barbie movie, and I used that sort of, at the center of the thumbnail, I used a, an image of, uh, Margot Robbie sort of standing there at the early parts of the movie where she's just, da-da, Brave um, Space 2001. And Google then, a little bit later, had this little thing in the studio about, uh, these are good thumbnails. Bang, that one. Of course, when I made it, everybody said, yeah, of course it's a good thumbnail. There's a beautiful woman on it. So part of that instrumentality comes from inside of men. Same thing with, actually, when I constructed this thumbnail, I had a few different ideas, but then I thought, no, my thumbnails, my pictures are usually too dark and too small. I'm just going to have these two pretty women on the thumbnail. And, well, yeah, this one went right up to number one of the last 10 videos. Bang, there it went. 
But then there's also the second order observation. So Oliver Anthony becomes, he I, I think you said it well, he comes to the surface of attention and there are multiple things going on in there. But a lot of this is, as um, Mueller notes, a lot of this is second order observation. That when people arise to this level of attention, they now become tools for us for our individual profilicity. And you can see this video that I played of Ryan Long playing an actor, Jack Hardy, who doesn't know how to take a stand on the Israel-Palestinian issue. And he simply must take a stand because to take a stand, then he sort of level jumps and he, to, to not be present, to not be there in terms of the public profilicity means, in a sense, he goes from bourgeois to proletariat. So, really, really good, really good observation. The act of observing the proletariat and bringing it into attention automatically transforms that proletariat into bourgeoisie. The act of observing Oliver Anthony is not just an act of observing, it has been, it is being successfully advertised to and a consequence of this advertising, Oliver Anthony amasses a great deal of wealth and ironically transforms into a rich man north of Richmond. And again, we saw the Bernie Sanders thing in this before as well, where, you know, Bernie Sanders in the election of 2016, you know, he's his whole thing is that I drive my own car, I pump my own gas, but... You know, in 2014, he runs a successful enough campaign that suddenly he writes a book and he becomes a millionaire and now he doesn't pump his own gas. Now he doesn't just drive that cheap little affordable economy car. But here's the problem that a lot of people thinking in the individualist frame doesn't understand. Oliver may have moved out of one social status, social economic status into another, but there is a cycle effect wherein another person will enter his former position. This is the fundamental flaw in pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Bootstraps now, <laughs> or by your boob straps if you're working on OnlyFans. Now, this again is where we're sort of getting into systems thinking. And the, the question behind the Louise Perry Ayla conversation was systems. And in many ways, Ayla was basically saying, I'll leave the system alone because it helps the poor. And Louise Perry is basically saying, This is corrosive, and the maintenance of this system actually is an injustice to the poor and is a is a trap to the poor mcdonald's employees leave um leave its work it pulls itself by up by its own boobs that bootstraps let's see i said it i'm going to keep tripping over this does this mean that someone else will not enter mcdonald's to fill those shoes and then you tell mcdonald's employees um to pull and it pulls and then it replaced by another ones and so on and so on it's recursive the practice of prostitution similarly has been a kind of employment opportunity for a long time. There's market demand for it just like this cell demands oxygenated blood. Maybe it's a lot of cells with discipline that can overcome their own demand and stop demanding. And again, this is when Louise Perry talked about, I don't know, didn't know anything about this, the Nordic strategy of prosecuting the Johns. You can address this, but this is also where I addressed in terms of the one of the ways to fight a culture war is to work on the demand side. And so AA doesn't, doesn't basically lobby the U.S. government for prohibition. AA works on the demand side. Because if you deal with the demand, well, then the supply will shrivel. And, and, and that's been, when you look at the strategy, let's say, with respect to abortion, that's been a big part of the, the abortion debate, too. And quite frankly, a lot of anti-abortion people have been both and. It's just a lot harder to work on the demand side because for many of these things, for drugs, for gambling, for prostitution, part of the reason these things are seen as vices is that they're traps. And gamblers become addicts 
and drinkers become addicts and drug addicts and sex addicts, these behaviors are addictive. And so it's a lot harder to work on the demand side. But these are, these are the tensions. And again, in a society, you're probably going to be working on both. You're probably going to l- try to limit the supply in some ways. But then you're also going to want to work on the demand side. Some people are asking nowadays why so many people are having a lot of anxiety surrounding AI and simultaneously building of it. And it's almost as if the building of it is being done in a decentralized emergent way. Right. There is no top-down authority dictating its development. That's right. It's a marketplace. It's because it is such a flexible form of intelligence that it potentially can address so many different kinds of demands. And when you have that much potential demand, you have all sorts of monetizing and efficiency um, applications that will drive the business onward. This is not disconnected from the above mentioned phenomena going on. As mentioned, the observation of the proletariat or attention putting upon it, it transforms the proletariat into bourgeoisie. This means that the constant cycling proletariat must always be in a state of invisibility and just outside of attention. A perfectly unattended thing is equal to a perfectly instrumentalized thing. We don't usually attend to the labors of the heart, litter, etc. The proletariat always merges into the machinery as a whole. And again, I think this is part of, this has been a lot of what technology has done, has done. We systematize and we use machines to do things that were recursive and now we don't think about it. I, um, I wash my clothes in my washing machine. Washing machines used to be an enormous source of human labor in the past. And when I lived in the Dominican Republic, you can put that on your bingo card. I would see women walking down to the stream with their pile of clothes and are just carrying water. I mean, plumbers, washing machines, these things have liberated all sorts of time for all sorts of things, which generally have, we've looked upon them as improvements. So there's a lot to this. Simultaneously, the proletariat has the redundant wish of being noticed, if it's a human being. I don't think my washing machine wants to be noticed. And in fact, when my washing machine is noticed, I'm annoyed and either I fix it myself or get someone to fix it or get a new washing machine. So it's no longer ignored. Jordan Peterson used to make this observation about the car. You wrap a car in this nice, shiny, colored metal so that you completely hide the complexity of it. On, off, get me down the road, period. That's what we want. And this question about human instrumentality with respect to justice is a very old one. Oh, by the way, someone reminded me that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So if your pastor is instrumentalized in your life, I guess this is the way, this is the month that that pastors ask for attention. (laughs) Uh, Where was I? As mentioned, the observation of the proletariat or attention put to it transforms the proletariat into bourgeoisie. I don't know if that always does. Part of what we see with social media is that because they are human beings, that happens, but I don't know that it always happens. This means that the constant cycling proletariat must always be in a state of invisibility and just inside of attention. Simultaneously, the proletariat has the redundant wish of being noticed. But it's impossible for it to be noticed because the moment it is noticed, it immediately transforms into non-proletariat. I, Algo served up for me an Alex O'Connor conversation with some uh, environmental group in the UK that was basically stopping traffic on the roadways in order to protest um, new oil drilling in the UK. And... So that gets into this whole attention thing. And so and so the only impossibility for the proletariat to solve its desire to be noticed for it to be um, for it to perfect its own consumption into the whole. This is part of the motivation to create AI. There are two ways that AI can solve the dilemma of the proletariat. It can replace the proletariat entirely, and that's you know something. Washing machines have replaced a lot of human labor. 
and thereby make the proletariat extinct or turning them into bourgeoisie to the degree that they can. That's one possibility that's talked about a lot. But another possibility is that the AI will genetically engineer the worker to become unconscious of its condition. This is Brave New World. This is basically the alphas, betas, gammas, and deltas. And as human beings are created for their system, a delta or a gamma is created to be happy with its own lot. And of course, in history, there have been all sorts of um, all sorts of conversation around that. Oh, slaves, slaves are just slave and they're happy in their own lot. So don't, don't raise that slave or that worker above their lot. And of course, some people are happy. <laughs> I know plenty of people who work in meaningful people-centered jobs and they say, I think I'd like to be a cashier because I can go to the store and I can scan the things. And when I go home at the end of the day, I leave my work behind. I hear that from a number of blue-collar workers. And so some people enjoy being instrumentalized because their job itself is an instrumentality in order to earn an amount of money to achieve other goals. They're working for the weekend. But another possibility is AI will genetically engineer the worker to become unconscious of its condition and not have the redundancy desire of design recognition. It will perfect the instrumentality of the worker in the same way the cell in the body will is perfectly instrumentalized. Another part of the motivation to create AI is that exploiting the evolutionary motivation to reproduce. Uh oh, I think I didn't get it all. Regretfully, that's where it ends. I probably just ran out of ran out of things. Now, now, how does this apply to this video? And the way I see it applying is, in many ways. Ayla is becoming a sex bot. That is what she's done. And she argues that the, in many ways, to become a sex worker is to become proletariat. Now, once she had, I, I read someplace that she now only does OnlyFans if you can pay $3,000 an hour. So she's not totally out of the instrumentality. Her argument, when she makes the argument that there should be no stigma attached to this is, again, and you see this in the label sex worker, is we want to simply be proletariat, sex proletariat. Okay. And I know earlier they talked about sex bots. Well, if people are happy with sex bots, that's okay. But, and then in that one passage, she says, you know, I did find doing it on OnlyFans to be dehumanizing, and actually the most human way to do it was skin to skin with in real life prostitution. But again, you've got to, to go back to Louise Perry's point, you've got to disenchant sex because there's a deep tie between this machine instrument instrument instrumentalizing and disenchantment in made in many ways it is the engine it is technology it is the recursive nature of this instrumentality the recursive nature of my washing machine that disenchants it and i want it disenchanted the difficulty is that to come full circle back to addiction Addiction is reciprocal narrowing. It is fundamentally a trick that's played where the addict is in one hand captive to an enchantment while they think they're going to get out of the enchantment with reciprocal narrowing because they are recursive in it. And so, and I think this is part of what Louise Perry gets an inkling of and what many of us intuitively note with respect to, let's say, sex workers, that it is dehumanizing, it is instrumentalizing, and you do basically become a sex bot. That's what you become. It is fundamentally dehumanizing, and you lose your agency. And, and I think there's no escaping it. And no matter how much you protest and say, well, it's better than factory work. And again, 
factory work as being the alternative is a really interesting is a really interesting counter because again I worked one summer uh, in college at a machine shop and <laughs> anybody in my family knows that I I'm not a narcoleptic by any means but um, get me at a point at the end of a long day and my parents did this too. Put me in front of the news and out I go. I used to have to struggle to stay awake at that machine shop because boy, oh boy, running that drill press or running that lathe for a number of hours during the day. And of course, I was a I was just basically a summer worker. I didn't have the skills that some of the other guys, the full-time guys had. And so they had me running certain machines. I also did a lot of sweeping. The sweeping in many ways was better than the machine work because it was dehumanizing and ai and machines increasingly take that out they the machine shot i was working you just got their first you know computer machine in this was back in the early 80s and um you know that was just getting to the frontier and for the most part it was a a little a little machine shop in North Jersey with about seven or eight guys, most of them immigrants. And, you know, it was, what was cool was getting to know the immigrants. A um, bunch of them were Muslim. And it was just fun listening to them talk about that because, you know, one of them would, would observe Ramadan and the other ones wouldn't, and they would talk about it. And, well, he observes Ramadan, but every now and then he eats pork or drinks. And so it was just fascinating just watching that whole interchange. But I digress. On to the next one. And, and you know, I love, I love this kind of pushback in the comments. I love people disagreeing with me and bringing forth a good argument. And so someone sticks up for her. So good for you. As a fan of Viela, although I must admit that when I did read that, I thought, what kind of a fan are you? <laughs> um, because, because, what does it mean to be her fan? I don't know. It, I don't think I want to know. Anyway, let's go on. I really appreciate the comment. As a fan of Ayla, let me propose an alternative framing. Take it on faith that Ayla is exceptionally successful in the industry of sex work, bracketing moral stances on prostitution and predation. Setting aside her transition into independent statistics... If you listen to her personal story or what she can could get through on her interview with Boyce with Megan Murphy, she successfully navigated the dangers of her work with integrity. Now, as I said earlier, she's clearly very intelligent. She's clearly very articulate. She's obviously beautiful. Um, she's industrious. It's amazing to me, you know, Katy Perry had a similar story of being a raised in a conservative Christian home and then going and doing other things. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't. She, she's she's a remarkable woman and she frankly could live a very remarkable life. There have been many women in history that were dealt difficult hands that worked prostitution. Maybe they became madams. Maybe they became courtesans. Maybe they became politicians. Um, you know, I would say, you know, how do you compare her to a very attractive woman who marries a very successful man and then gains all of his wealth and status, even if she brought only beauty into the relationship, beauty and personality and all of those things. So, you know, I'm, I, I don't really, if she wanted to come on my channel, I would definitely give her a Randos conversation. She would be a very interesting person to sit down and have a two hour conversation just to explore her life and her choices. I also agree with many people here that I think 30 years from now, I have different opinions about what I did 30 years ago, I'm sure she will too. Setting aside her trends, uh, she successfully navigated the dangers. Now, run the experiment of men in sports. A vanishingly small number of boys will find NBA success. 
What is it to be said of all the boys that don't make it? <laughs> so my my two oldest sons played basketball. They played varsity basketball at a decent sized school here in Northern California. And sorry, Jared Phillip was a little better at basketball. Jared was bigger, but Phillip being a little bit smaller, he was six one instead of six four. Um, he had to be better and he was you know, and I remember telling him in high school at one point, me and dad. Because I could, he, he said a few things that basically were thinking, I'm going to go to the NBA. I, I basically said to him, you're good at basketball, but you're not going to the NBA. And so then someone else heard that I had told him that. It's like, how, how could you say that to your son? Because it's the truth. He was a, he was a good player. He could have played college ball at Calvin, you know, a Division three school. Might have even started at that, but... To play in the NBA, it's super elite. And someone in the comment section, NFLs may be a better, a better. Suppose we didn't respect their human potential and stigmatize their self-exploitation of physical prowess. But this gets into the question of, which was the question of the enchantment of sex. Is sex just like basketball? If I play basketball with you, is that... The same thing as me having sex with you. And the answer is no. That's Louise Perry's point. Because if you completely disenchant sex, then go get me a cup of coffee and um, get on your knees and do the president some service, Monica, are the same thing. Is a handshake the same as a hand? Beep. You would say no. I remember one watching one comedy thing. You know, uh, you know why, why don't why don't why don't guys just sit around and you know get each other off, whether they're gay or not? Because guys like to get off, so why why not? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Why not? Sex is enchanted. Sex is special. Sex is sacred. And that's part of the difference about now the NBA and the NFL, especially the NFL, there are real questions about it in terms of, I, I saw an article recently that N, NFL running backs are kind of forming a union because the NFL, a lot of NFL teams have figured out that running backs are semi-disposable. There are not too many running backs as good as Christian McCaffrey, who's on my fantasy team, hopefully he's not injured too long. Most of them are sort of plug and play now, and it's tremendously hard on the body, and they will have lifelong physical things because of it. So, you know, you might say, well, there's some, yeah, and that's something that should be considered. Yet, it's not sex. Sex is special. If we didn't provide a place for them in society with other respectable work, that transference of their skills wouldn't be the local court and the NBA pipeline as offensive and exploitative without the pipeline. Uh, but it's also the case that there's a tremendous status hierarchy with the NBA or the NFL. And a lot of guys play in high school and then college and slowly they peel off. And But there are also a lot of other, so you've got sex is different, first of all. And secondly, there are a lot of other benefits that they accrue. They might get a college scholarship. They might um, learn some values and they might learn some things. And for, and for a lot of people, this is a good thing. Now, you might argue that, well, starting your OnlyFans, first of all, to to riff off a 1950s song, good looking girls come a dime a dozen. And it's true. And the older you get as a man, the more you realize it. When you're in college, you know, and you're kind of scoping around, seeing who you want to date, who might be a potential spouse, you're pretty discriminating. When you get to be old, it's like, all you young people are beautiful. And why do you say that? It's because I know what it's like to lose your beauty. And just like I know what it's like to lose my hair. So this Instagram to OnlyFans pipeline, I don't think that there is as much collateral benefit in there 
and there's way more collateral damage in there than there is, let's say, playing high school ball, playing college ball, maybe playing semi-pro ball. There's a lot more benefit in there. Sex is different. Sex is different. That's the point of Louise Perry's book. And the fact that the left can't both on one hand sacralize sex in the way that it does. Oh, you know, Governor Cuomo, he had to get out of office. Russell Brand is a monster. You can't do that and disenchant it at the same time. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because Governor Cuomo was just doing, following his biology. No, there are standards. But anyway, great comments. Really appreciate the comment. I think there were a few others that I wanted to say something about. All right, that's it for now. Great comments again. Uh, leave a comment and uh, I'll see you later.